Welcome back, everyone, to all of our discussion groups and participants watching from home. Uh, I hope you've had uh, time to really sort of come up with some questions and, and maybe exchange some ideas amongst yourselves. Um, as a reminder, anyone can submit a question using the questions tab on the webinar control panel. So uh, we're about to, uh, to, to carry it over to our panelists and, and uh, do our best to answer some of the questions. Uh, we, we're, they're still coming in here right now. Um, maybe to get us rolling, uh, I can ask uh, each, of, each of you, Elvira, Jay, and Rena, whether you could maybe share with us just a, uh, an example of, a, of an experience design challenge that you re recently faced and how you dealt with it. Elvira, do you want to start us off? Oh. Yeah, Elvira, just, just a second. We're just going to unmute. Oh, are you on mute on your, on your uh, computer? Yes. Good catch. Now we hear you. Perfect. Um, I think we're facing daily challenges. I think that's the um, that's part of the fun. If you're at some point see it as a design thinking exercise. And I mean, from organizing and planning projects to all the way through, and like something doesn't work. I think what we to make it a bit more specific and um, a little less uh, arbitrary. What we do a lot here is prototyping in house. So, it's, and one maybe more of an insight to share, especially when we create um, interactions that like that really relate to space. The more you can build it one to one, the less struggle you will have on site on installation. And maybe that was like one of the bigger challenges recently when we installed um, at the Aris, uh, Art Museum in Denmark, we installed three interactive installations and we had built them all in house, one literally one to one. The other one came with a new technology and very late. So we kind of had trouble just to doing that. And so we kind of estimated some things and like the room was a bit more tricky. And that came then with some surprises on site. So I think the more specific you can be uh, to really understand the physical constraints and how it impacts the way people behave, um, the better. If I could just comment, Elvira, you've done a really wonderful job. And each one of you sort of have told a little bit of a different aspect of the story. And for me, I know some of the things that I really picked up on, uh, Elvira, m much of what you described to us, and even in this instance, something that is very immersive, where you're really able to uh, influence or you know control many of the uh, the environment and, and what that experience is. And and Rena, you touched upon an interesting aspect because I, I picked up on a lot of the uh, the product aspects, which is sort of we. You know, they live in the world in a different in a different way, and there's a and so you're you're engaged. You know, people are engaging with with products in a slightly different way when they're out in a world where you can't control so many aspects. And Jay, you mentioned this aspect of connecting the dots, and I wonder if you know if some of the challenges. You know, as you sort of share maybe some of these stories of challenges that you have, is is there you know could is it sometimes in that area where um, who's really owning the the experience or uh, how do you sort of play well together when you, when when everybody has uh, disparate needs and, and interests? Yeah, I was I was going to share actually uh, one of the challenges that that we that I faced before, and that's kind of related to what you just said, which is um, how do we play well together? How do we play well together in a way that we can get out of the tactics? Because I think in a lot of the businesses essentially um, they operate and seeing they want to see immediate business results so tactics get you immediate business results so let's let's work on what we need to ship and deliver tomorrow but how do we really start to play well together to start to understand you know in experience design it's it's more than just tactics there are tactics in that but a lot of it is about you know some of the things that that I and, and the others had mentioned it's about interconnectedness it's about the deep meaning it's about what you feel and so it's it's hard to get people to play well together and really see the value of investing in experience design uh, and and the strategic elements of that yeah the uh, it's an interesting conundrum but it's the in the contradiction that we live um, and what I what I'm trying to say is 
by nature, we have so many points of views. So the irony of craft and thinking as an object of desire is contradictory. <laughs> it takes a lot of people to uh, forge that steel, if you will. Uh, but as you can see, you know, and I was an industrial designer as a background, so I used to own everything. And designing software and services, it opens you up. You're free. So you have different kinds of high standards. You want things to be great, but you're also, I always feel I'm closer to an arch architect, not, not necessarily the, the glass you know, ceiling thing, but more around, you know, you walk around any city. What city is pristine? Those are pretty boring. I like mid-century, but I would never dress my home completely in 90 degrees and I'll just get bored, you know. I want IKEA, I want McDonald's. So life is messy. And then our job is what can we do there in terms of filtering customers and have them have different kinds of customers, have different kinds of experiences. It's a very hard challenge. But uh, you know, so whether it's you know election, you know, you know, like the whole debate around red shirt, blue shirt, like I'm trying to think outside of that box to think about what are the diversity that we have to have empathy for? And to me, like, that's sort of the experience design that we're sort of touching as design leaders and the conversation we need to have. Very interesting. Abdul, you've got, we've got a few questions here. Yeah. So um, uh, what, this first question is from Niagara College. And uh, one of Jay Park, Jay, one of your uh, experience design ingredients was empathy. Uh, does this become even more important in a world that seems to be moving in the opposite direction for, for so many. You know, when we think about the Trump era, and we're really getting much more closed. How, how, how does empathy play? Yeah, I mean, again, like, I, I, here's the only advice I give any young designers, not to say that because I'm older, I'm wiser <laughs> necessarily, but when I kind of boil down to things that I feel that I know I can count on is, A, are you a curious person? And this comes up a lot from a lot of different people. If you're not curious, you're not awake. If you're not awake, you're not going to have awareness. You're not going to know where you are. You don't, you're not listening. You don't have empathy. So I think, you know, not to make this, a, again, a political thing, but I, I had a talk that I didn't uh, finish but it had all to do, this was closer to last November, <laughs> but it had a lot to do more about, wow, what happened? Same thing. I felt something, and it's not, it's too easy to say, oh, it's the blue team versus the red team. That's not what this is about. And when I went through my journey, the thing that I found around empathy was, uh, I'll, I'll forget the person's name, but there's a range of moral primitives that most humans are born with, and then you, depending on where you end up living, nurture, it shapes which moral primitives you end up using a lot more. And I thought that was very fascinating. So if you happen to be more in a cosmopolitan place, you know, certain things are part of that ingredient. You exercise those moral uh, primitives more. So example would be do no harm. It's a big moral primitive. You know, caring. Uh, you might not care so much about loyalty and authority, but those are, you're born with them. But if you are more parochial, not by your choice, but you're born into a smaller place, less diversity, those things become part of your value. So how can you say it's right or wrong? But, but in general, I always think the kind of conversation we have here is, as design leaders, you know, how do you, how do you create that empathy? How can we listen to the world a little bit better, and how do you play off that 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 tension point between wanting to be very global and responsible, but also be very caring about the tribe? Because we we still go home, right, for our holidays. It's very tribal. Even the most globalist person go home usually. You know, you want that hug. So so that's that's just human condition. I don't know if I answered it, but. I think I think they're very good points, and I'm sure it stimulates. Avira and, and Rina, please, if, if they spark uh, ideas that you want to comment, um, 
but I, you know, it, it makes me think a little bit about how, in general, in the design profession, we are tend to be more sympathetic. We 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 we're trained more in listening. But I I still wonder, you know, even when you think about empathy, well, or, or or doing good, doing something that is good. But I wonder whether you know, experience design is going to play out in a way that isn't necessarily always so um, <laughs> kind and uh, and sympathetic or compassionate to a range of views. I wonder if we're going to sort of see that aspect of experience design you know, potentially be misused or used for purposes that are not quite as altruistic as what you're touching upon. Yeah. Okay. I think there's something interesting here even, I thought it was so interesting how the three of us in our intro, you could really see from the, the background we're coming from, even just kind of the, the terminology we're using. Um, and the one thing too is to kind of referring Whenever or very often, like when referring to experience design, we're referring to customers, and that's already where I'm like, wait, if we're talking about empathy and we're talking about, to your point of like, are we making this world a better place? If we literally constantly coming from the vantage point of what like that, the ultimate goal is always to buy or to like get this connection to a brand and the loyalty is this really like if we're coming from that like very commercially driven point of view then the empathy is not that far then we abuse empathy for a clear purpose so I really even just to think about the customers as people as an audience as visitors even just changes I think sometimes really like language changes also the way we look at things and that we might think about concepts and I think it often opens up a bit more creative space too. And just one small thing too about Dave, what I really love, like the idea of curiosity, because there's also the notion about it that it's the antidote to fear. So whenever you have fear and you actually stay in the moment and you, instead of going into the, like the worst case scenario, which is like fear in the future, which is not being here now, but like looking at it with a sort of curiosity, we're like, what is happening right now without getting personally too involved or whatever it is, like so much creative potential in there. And I'm not sure we always as designers are so, I think either like left progressives, like liberals, left progressives, designers, we often think we have this like tolerance and empathy, but it already stops like, when our tribe, speaking about tribes in terms of politics, on the other side, I mean, have you ever had like a Republican at one of the Ivy League schools giving a big lecture? When was the last time? So, it's I'm a bit more critical about those things, so, um, but I think they're good points. I think, um, Elvira, you make a really good point about the inherent tension that exists in us as experienced designers maybe wanting to do something for the greater good and building that empathy for the greater good as opposed to just things being commercially focused. And I think that's kind of, it feels like that's the magic million dollar question. Like how do we crack that where businesses are focused on the revenue, but we want to push that into being about more. And if we can find that intersection of how do you do both? And I know that sounds a little bit altruistic maybe, but I wonder, is there a way where we can do both, where we can find that intersection of, hey, here's some good we can do and here's how we can impact a culture or a community in a positive way and still demonstrate and deliver some value to a business such that we can uh, motivate that business to maybe invest in that effort and you know it's a big question and I, I know there's no easy answer but can we do that and I think Jay I was also um, something you said about our moral primitives uh, really struck a chord with me I think that's a really good point where each we each come to this world with our moral code our wiring certain fundamentals that form how we see the world and and I think that's where, um, you know, when we talk about meaning, I think it all ties into that. How are we wired to see the world? What do we think is right or wrong? And how do we obtain that deep satisfaction that, hey, I did something good in my life or I got something good out of this life? And I think going full circle on that, how do we design products and services that really give that to people? So doing, again, that good for people granted through a commercial context. Great, great points. I'm going to uh, just refer to one of our other questions here. So this question comes from St. Lawrence, Col Lawrence College. 
and it is, uh, can all experiences between two defined dots be designed? How strict do parameters have to be to guide a user without always holding their hand? And I think so all of you sort of, you know, I guess that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's leaving that role for the person that is uh, to conduct their own path, I suppose. Um, so, you know, how strictly do you have to set those parameters or how, or how broadly do you allow them to expand? Mm -hmm. Anybody like to take that one on? You know, I'm, I wonder if it's, I wonder if there's a certain leap that we can design for. So, um, not necessarily holding the user's hand through, very literally, through, through, uh, through two connection points. Um, but designing the touch points or connection points in a way that the user can take a leap and kind of jump from one point to the other. I think a lot of times we see experiences that kind of feel like they dead end the user. So they use one aspect of it and then where do I go next and how does this kind of tie into this larger mesh? Um, so maybe there's a way to design for that leap um, without the literal here's how you get there. Mm -hmm. It, more of that that aspect, like that aspect of anticipating and 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 building in those uh, that that network idea or, or or leaving open those opportunities. I think especially with artificial intelligence and things like that, it's kind of starting to anticipate how might a user um, desire the next thing or what might they desire and how do we anticipate that? Okay, um, I, I'll jump to another to another question and and uh, see what it sparks. Uh, this one is for, uh, for Rena, and it's from Stephen here in Toronto. If I understood your point, do you consider some kind of value chain or hierarchy when designing, whereby higher order engagement is possible by designing beyond individual identities or aggregated personas? Could we envision a future where there are design experiences developed for hundreds or thousands of differently identified groups? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that was uh, the point that I was intending to touch on. And um, again, it's a big question, but um, I think, you know, I look at my personal experience and, and where I started my career, and it really was looking at individual identities. So it was, and, and still to this day, you know, I, I look at my team currently at PlayStation or previously at Citrix, and we focus a lot on user personas and what are the needs and goals of that person. And you know, we've started now branching out beyond that to um, to achieve that higher order engagement. So, you know, what are those artifacts? I don't know. Do we call them personas or what are they? But you know, let's not just look at this one person's needs, but what about their friends or what about the community that they live in? And what are the needs and opportunities in that space? And so, um, yeah, I think there is a possibility that maybe we design for infinitely possible scenarios. And I, I think that you can't define all the possible, I think as you get to that level of higher order, as you look at a culture, how do you define all of that culture's needs and how do you craft a limited set of artifacts for that? But I think you can start to see how those themes ladder up. So what is that common thread of need between the person and between the society that they live in and between the culture that they exist in? And can we start to, again, open up the experiences that we design to start to tackle some of those higher order needs? It, it makes me think about, you know, we live in this world where there's this increasing sense of complexity and ambiguity and more, you know, all these variables. And and, and I, I know we had you know, sort of one of the other uh, uh, points we'd like to touch on this evening is this aspect about how do you overcome say or how do you work you know in a tangible way when you're sitting down with a client and you're trying to take them through that how do you handle you know all of those uh, those factors it was one it's one aspect to sort of describe a, a fairly simple persona and to and to put that through the paces but when we start dealing with this additional level of complexity any tips that you have from that standpoint Rena, because you're sort of you know, mentioning that aspect of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. I didn't. I wanted to give other people a chance. <laughs> oh, sorry. Anybody can step in. But. Um, there go. <laughs> sure. Um, I think that I think that um, when looking at how to make that a reality, I, I'll I'll give an example of where we've had to do that. Um, uh, one example is at Citrix, and at Citrix we worked on GoToMeeting, so looking at how people collaborate. And um, a lot of that, again, was um, 
you know, based in uh, very tactical personas who are users, who are buyers, um, but starting to have those conversations around um, not only do ha not only do we look at how people have remote meetings online, but how are they really looking to collaborate with each other, and how do through our work we change the nature of how businesses work remotely uh, across the globe. And as we were having those conversations, it was easier to have that conversation as a design team. Um, once we started working with product management and development, things started getting tactical again. So. I think the challenge we had was how do we articulate the value in thinking at that higher order level. So um, I think it, it was a learning exercise for us being able to articulate, try to articulate the business value again. Um, you know, what, how, how might engagement uh, go up or active usage go up or conversions go up if we, if we start to tap into some of those deeper needs. Jay, anything you'd like to add? Um. No, I was, I was, something, apologies, something that we were talking about made me drift a little bit. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the word that came to my head was dopamine. I don't know. <laughs> and I think where I was, I'm trying to track why I was wondering. I think I was wondering because, you know, like it's, the world that at least I live in is all about, you know, more stuff, more products. And yeah, there's things that, like, you know, going back to your other question, to me, like, we, like, humans are pretty smart. You know, I have, I have two kids, they're, they're 14 and 12, and they are very smart. But we, as humans, our tools can't, like, we make some weird decisions. <laughs> you know, so I feel like we add a lot of friction to things. And to me, like, I, I'm not sure about how much boundary we need for someone to succeed on their end goals and all that stuff, or provide an experience that's, you know, something you want to come back for, whether it's to make money or just have meaning. But, you know, I feel like half of my job is to remove friction. But then what got me thinking was the dopamine thing. Like, you know, at least my kids are girls and they don't, they're not at least into gaming. My, my, uh, my brother's kids, uh, you know, oh, this is getting recorded. Uh, just boys in general. Wow, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, video gaming going on, and you know, you know, we we talk about virtual reality and all that, but like to me, I just finished reading Snow Crash, you know, reread Neuromancer, and I feel like, you know, if we're picking up our phone and looking at it 150 times a day, you're kind of jacking in. So like we're getting our fix already. So it just made me think about, like, what do you do with all that? Like, do I need all that? There's an excess amount of stimulation. <laughs> We're already getting, yeah. so I'm kind of be, becoming a little more philosophical after, you know, you know, Elvira talked about you know customer and being more consumer oriented. I guess. Thank you, um, Abdul. Do we have any other questions? Or are we going to sort of? I've got a, I've got a, a few others that we can sort of um, you know consider. Um, I guess one of it is um, it, it sounds like all of you in the in the course of, of, of your work today, I'm guessing you probably the discussion about experience design happens pretty early in the in the project in the in, you know certainly in the in the creative process rather than leaving it as an afterthought. But perhaps I'm wrong. Do you find yourself if you're in a very applied way and working on a very tactical aspect? Is you know does it come in later in the in the stage or maybe you could just uh, you know comment on on that, how that experience design, how it comes into the process. Elvira, maybe we start with you. Well, for me, it's no question because that's what we do. Like we literally, like ev at least my every single project that I've been dealing with at Look Project is an experience design challenge. So there's an institution that has an agenda that has a topic that it wants to convey um, and we're thinking about how to turn that into an experience that allows people to engage with it in a meaningful and different way. So we start with experience ideas. That's really where it all starts. I mean, after the preparation for that. But the, um, yeah, that's what we do. So we, we're dealing with this every day. Is it similar for you, Rena? 
I, I think I've experienced um, a slightly a, a different reality, and, and maybe that's just coming from you know working in corporate environments where it's maybe we're not starting out Elvira, like you said, with the purpose of designing an experience. So I've worked at places where um, the design teams were of varying levels, um, at varying levels of maturity. So working in some organizations where we were brought on sooner in the process and maybe not quite as early as we'd like to be, but fairly soon, soon enough to be able to influence the what and the why. What should the experience be and why, why are we doing this and, and why should it be a certain way? Um, versus uh, having worked in some environments where you know, maybe we were at an earlier uh, state of maturity and the design team was brought on much later, um, too late to be able to experience the what and the why and to really create an experience, but more just all these boundaries have been put up and now you're being brought on to just figure out how to create it. So kind of been at varying stages. Yeah, I think, um, you know, definitely working on a technology companies, uh, uh, you know, another thing that I think I've, I've done is I'm in the business of what we call creating runways, and it's not given to you. And uh, cross-functional teams, we have a recipe. It's not a, a original recipe. <laughs> it's called um, Stanford University Design School. I think calls it BXT, Business Exper uh, Experience and Technology. And the concept is these these uh, three circles intersect. And I, I've leveraged that at Microsoft and here as well. And the whole point there is back to you want to start, you know, things end well if you start well. And so it's a very simple idea. You start together and you need to spar with different disciplines, but it's not a democratic process either. You need to have your points of views. But the more you can deliberate together through a process, and I think the harder shift in the culture for me across two big companies were, you know, it's very easy uh, for the process to feel uh, a linear by function. So you start with program management, they write, they want you to paint their docs, and then the moment it's written, the devs want to code and you have no runway. So then the, it's a common dialogue. It's like, no, we don't paint your docs. You know, and you describe the how, we need you to describe the why and what. And then you know you do this for a while, and you know once you once you've kind of gone through that experience, and they see the value of how design can really contribute, they want that. And then you just have to keep reminding, hey, let's this is the phase we're doing what and what. What are the folks with the crayons? Don't worry about that. We'll work with the you know developers to make sure things are feasible. We'll stretch their mind, etc. So once you kind of get that cycle going, uh, you can really do some really interesting and cool stuff. And it really helps to have good leaders who really embrace that. So I don't think it's uh, as as uh, uh, you know dark as 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 I've, I've heard some people make it out to. I actually enjoy making things with you know real people and making real products. And this is kind of how we do it. So. I, I think these concepts and even you know the, the language it's all taking root is getting traction people are you know the, the design community and out and then outwards from there clients start becoming more and more aware and maybe start looking for this more holistic view but I think that we're going to go through this phase that is probably challenging because on the other end you know one of our questions here was how people are starting to close down and I think that even in some client organizations you have that sense that people just want a simpler life they are really looking to all of a sudden bring in more uh, factors and you know take a take a broader view of, 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 of experience but um, I, th I think that you're giving us all great ideas as far as how we might be champions for this within our organizations. Are there particular uh, ways? Sorry. Go just ahead. to one notion, experience does not need to be complex, and an experience does not need to be like an experience can very much serve to the idea of simplicity. Like that's yeah. not a. Um, it really depends on like, and most of the times we're, we're actually, that's I think what most of us are trying to achieve to like make it very accessible, to make it very intuitive, to not like have a hard threshold. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think the outputs are thriving 
or at least the leaders in the field are thriving for complexity in the, in the terms of like the way we use it and, get, and engage with it. What's behind it and the content might be and the results, but not the engagement itself. Oh, I, I agree, and I, I guess like you know what I was sort of getting at was the the organizations that many designers that are tuning in where they're working for mm -hmm. have silos and they have all of their ways of doing things, and their you know the teams don't necessarily work as well together. And so to be a champion of this, you know, to get to that what can be a, a simpler solution and but a more holistic and a more thoughtful one is 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 maybe uh, going to be a bit of a challenge for for some of us as we go as we go through these these phases of, of adoption. Absolutely, yeah. Um, just um, uh, you know, another aspect. I wonder if each of you would have your own favorite go-to resources, or where are you getting your inspiration from? Uh, how do you how are you staying up and staying on top of trends and and, and the evolution of of, of these ideas? Um, I'm happy to start. I think for me, um, a lot of it is just talking to other people. Um, I think just talking to other colleagues, trying to figure out and understand what, what are the spaces that they're working with and what are the problems that they're trying to solve. Um, you know, what, how are they trying to champion things or push things on their end to kind of encourage this higher order thinking. And um, it's just, it's fascinating how talking to just a few different people can open up your mind so much. Um, you know, right now I'm, I'm working in the entertainment space at PlayStation. Prior to that, I was working in, you know, enterprise, how people get work done at Citrix, but maybe talking to someone at Facebook, it's a whole different problem that they're trying to solve or talking to someone at Google or, or Amazon or, you know, anything. It, I think that's what's been most helpful for me to learn about different problems, um, looking at um, social impact spaces and people who work in that space. Um, I think too that um, actually as I use products and as I find myself immersed in experiences that other people have created, trying to step back and kind of think about it and not just, you know, go through the motions of using it, but step back and, hey, what am I using? How does this feel? Um, how, maybe, how did the designer um, intend for this to feel? And kind of think about it that way. And um, I have a few colleagues at work. We get to, we like to geek out on this together. So we'll get in front of a whiteboard and pick another product or experience and start thinking through some of these things. And we're just hypothesizing, but it gets the brain juices going. Jay or Elvira, any particular ways that you keep yourself fresh and growing? Um, for me, you know, I'm not lazy, but you know, like here's what's happened. It's uh, last four years. About four years ago, I noticed that it's always New Year's Eve, and I'm trying to think big, and I'm stressing out. You know, it's another round around the sun. You know, what's going on? Am I looking at things? You know, context. So. I had a, an interesting idea. I'll just start, you know, on Thanksgiving. I'll give myself a full week from it to start this process. And I was kind of grown into this thing where I'm constantly after something. And, you know, it, so what I've been doing is I've been looking at, uh, you know, I like to just start just in general. Like, I kind of did the whole thing on universe. Like, where are we? <laughs> you know, like, where are we really? So I kind of did this whole information design on where we are and trying to understand what that means. So, so once I got over that, I ran into a book called Sapiens, you know, Brief History of Humankind. Uh, fascinating uh, understanding of us, another point of view. Then I ran into uh, this book. It's a, kind of a nerdy book, but not really. It's a, it's a UN reports on 15 major trends uh, every year. And if you look at that, that's a pretty big blueprint of what's going on. <laughs> and then from there, you know, I started going into a few other sections, like there's a whole thing on grid, utility. There's a whole thing on water. There's a whole thing on genes by this person, Siddhartha. So I'm just kind of categorical. And then I just picked up this kind of boring book uh, about health system in U.S., but it's, you know, because I felt like I can't really speak to any points of view. It's like, I don't know. It's complicated. Uh, who's right? You know, well, <laughs> let's go to the prime. I like going to the primary source. I learned this from, you know, my middle school kids. Like, 
you know, the trend is let's look at the primary source. <laughs> I love that idea. So, you know, why listen to someone else's interpretation? Um, so those things are helping me kind of sketch out foundationally where we are and where we're going. And I think, uh, uh, you know, so I keep an eye on those things. And then, you know, when big events happen, you have to follow your emotion again. So the election definitely led me through a few other kind of investigations. And one of them was this concept of pendulum. Like there's this idea that every 80 years something happens. You swing, the society swings from a me culture to a we culture. So 80 years ago, you know, again, I'm not a gloom, and gloom guy, but it was just, you know, that we had FDR. And he was the most, he was actually one of the better leaders. His peers were Mussolini, Hitler, and Stalin. So, you know, hey, what is that? What's going on in the society? You know, what, what are, what's happening there? How will things turn out? Uh, you know, it, there's a book called Currency War, which is all about currency. What does Trump mean when he says, you know, uh, you know, China is, you know, a currency manipulator? You know, but in fact, for eight years under Obama, we did quantitative easing, which is basically another way of diluting your currency. So, you know, I know what's the impact globally? Like, it's very intricate, but if you don't understand this stuff, it's hard to talk about it. So, uh, and, you know, I, and I look for leaders and builders, and I think, you know, we have one in, in my company, but clearly, you know, uh, Facebook, if you looked at their conference, there's a leader, and he's got a 10-year vision, and they're building, they're committing. Just like, you know, in the 20s, we build highways. And so that becomes a reality. Then you have to kind of deliberate on, well, what is that all about? And where does that end up? Uh, you know, so that's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm pretty organic, but then I try to piece together things that I feel like are pretty meaty systems that, that are either really archaic, and we know a change is coming, because we're sort of in this hybrid world of, again, digital and physical. And, you know, like I think Penn Station, like today, they just, just said, we're going to stop the trains. Why? It's not working. <laughs> just like, you know, this is the this is United States. Uh, that's, that's a head scratcher, right? Uh, you go to Korea and you can have internet access on every stop of every train. So here we are. So that's, you know, I'm kind of organic, but I look for kind of big, big plumbing, but also uh, look for uh, things that I think are impacting our human humanness a little bit. And what are the changes we can anticipate? Those are fascinating points. Thank you. And some good reference, some good books for us to go and watch for. Elvira, anything you'd like to uh, share? Yeah. Um, I think it's super interesting for what both of, uh, what Rina and Jay referred to, like for Rina, the I can totally relate to the, so much happening within the workspace actually. Also like here, we're like 70 people sitting like in one big office together. So there's just a lot naturally coming in. And I think what Jay refers to and what I at some point also had to understand because at some point I was like almost like freaking out. I'm like, how do I keep up? as being the creative director, as her, like being able to like set that vision and guide the team like through that, like, do I need to know everything? But I think it's much more about really those macro views that allow you to even just initiate or think like and be able to come up with a conceptual twist. Like because I have a team, I like I much more I need to be able to have that helicopter perspective of at the end of the project. And while they are here, kind of like here, like, ah, they're all going crazy, I'm here to guide them. And I need to be able to ask the right questions and kind of like find the, kind of the, find the precious moments and then elevate them and, and like together with them, shape them so that when we're here, we, we're getting to the goal. So. That's why I think what Jay does, like this, like investing in the macro vision and thoughts is so crucial for people who really lead the big teams. And then for me, the other part, for me, what I always say, I get this question quite a lot, is like what I tell, especially also students, to really go out into the world. 
stop especially for designers, communication designers, etc. stop just hanging in the internet and looking at what all the other designers do. Yeah. It's you're just going to be copycat. Yeah. And if you look at all the really good ones, it's rare that you're going to be better. But if you really go out and you observe and you experience yourself and this curiosity to, to not just like like what is there, but to observe, like what does this do to me? How do I, like why do it? Why do I have this reaction? And bring that back um, allows you and, and kind of like trying to find your your own what you're interested in. Like what what is it? Like for me, at some point, I was like, okay, I'm really looking for vibrant gestures that strike that emotional chord, and I'm doing that a lot through creating atmospheres. And even just to understand that, let me like relate them differently to the world when I observe it, but also kind of like being clear on like I want to have on on the output I'm 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 trying to get to. So just go out, like stop just like hanging in your favorite blocks. Um, it's important to have know what's going on. Like no, don't misunderstand me. Like understand the trends for sure, but don't get stuck in them. Like, what is your conceptual twist? What is your, like, how do you elevate it? How do you make it yours? How do you ask different questions? That's great. You really have to get out there and be curious and engaged, I think, is sort of what, what, what I take from that. I'm just going to check and see, do we have any other questions that we want to sort of um, approach with? Sorry. So, um, uh, we still got a few more minutes before we can wrap up. Maybe I'm, I'm, I suggest that we maybe take the next 10, 15 minutes. And, and uh, if there's any uh, other thoughts that uh, that you'd like to share with our group, that would be great. Um, I'll just sort of, you know, I, we've touched upon a lot of these concepts, but um, you know, if you sort of see this, this the trajectory that experience design is still sort of early on as it's going, but do you have any ideas as to where you sit? What's, what's, what's at, the, at the end of the rainbow, if there's ever such a thing? Um, where do you see the future of experience design unfolding? Is there some phase that we want to get to, a, 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 a world that we're going to live in, that, that, uh, that you're helping guide us towards? That's a big question. It is a big question. It's the future. <laughs> Elvira, I'll challenge you even first. You, you had said, you know, because I, I, I think that, um, you know, for me at least, I, I love the way that, that uh, the, you know, the projects that you've been involved with when all of a sudden you can, uh, in some ways, you know, simplify and create an experience that is connecting with, with, with a number of different people, but because you've sort of taken out some of the other distractions, you, you've, you've created a moment that, that people are experiencing simultaneously. And I wonder if that's, you know, how that might scale up if you were outside of a, a, a particular venue, how, did, how does that start expanding? And maybe it is back to some of those inter, intersection points, but anything that you sort of, sort of imagining and that's setting a direction? I think the first thing that popped in my mind was the question, will the barriers or the manifestation of technology fall away and just be somehow embedded um, and it just all devices, etc., go away, whatever that means and however scary that might be. And then my next thought was, Maybe at some point, but probably not so quickly. And we heard so much about the death of the book and the death of the of the radio and I don't know what. And what we actually see is that it all survives. And I think what with new technology or what we see with VR, etc., I think it's more that the toolbox expands. And for us as experienced designers, it's going to be more and more important to be specific about the tool we use for a specific goals and a little less like oh VR is so hip so like let's make this as a VR and you're like why that makes no sense like why would you use VR for that it's actually a really shitty experience then um, so but at some point where you're like hey what is VR really good for and what can it do that other technology cannot do and if that is what we want to provide at that like intersection of space and time and humans 
then that's a bad thing, and then then a book cannot do the job. But there are I've just recently <laughs> seen a, a project where I was like, you should have made a book out of this. It would have been much more enjoyable. <laughs> um, so just kind of maybe the but we'll always I mean technology is always when it, something new comes up it's always just interesting to explore it because we know like innovation there's a new there's a new room for innovation opening up with new technology every time I mean from book printing to today right so um, and once that early craziness about the the magic of it itself cools down a little bit. I think we can become just more meaningful with it. Kind of like more, maybe not meaningful, but more purposeful. And kind of okay, when is it a book? When is it a magazine? When is it a video? When is it VR? And when is it I don't know the next stage? And when is it AR? When is it what? When what makes sense at what point in time? Rena, anything either on the distant future or the, or the near future? Where, where do you see it going? Yeah, um, I definitely agree with everything Elvira said about technology and the possibilities there. Um, I think um, intelligence, and I hesitate as I say that word, I think it could be an arrogant thing to say that you know we can be intelligent enough to know what people want, but I think that um, we can build um, intelligence of our experiences in a way that doesn't necessarily dictate um, what that experience should be for people, but um, enables uh, different types of experiences in a flexible way um, by us kind of building that intelligence. So I think there's an opportunity there, and I think when we look at um, things like AI and, and bots and, and what that's that's doing now, it's really exciting to see some of those things. But I think, again, the, the potential as we look further, I think there is huge potential there. And again, sort of less in that um, here's how it's going to be way, because we know what you want, but um, how can we understand you better as, as a user or a consumer and give you the flexibility to experience different things. And then I think in addition to that, just um, kind of some of what we were discussing earlier, depth and breadth. So depth in terms of um, inward depth, so understanding the deeper layers of the people that we are designing for, um, looking outwards, um, you know, that sort of breadth of um, thinking bigger, so not just a person, but, you know, a culture or a society. Um, and I think, um, and Jay touched on this too, but interconnectedness. So it th really things are interconnected, so not thinking of things as a single point in someone's journey, but a mesh. Jay, any any uh, other thoughts? Uh, you know, like I think for for you know the future, there there's something that's very linear and uh, exponential about growth of things that you you know I think I'm just kind of scratching my head on. Um, then there are just things that are more stable, like arts where you know you don't need any of that to be artistic so it's always going to be our you know uh struggle for you know it's not technology right it's it's humans where we we have the range of we have the capacity to go from good bad to ugly it's not the technology that can do that yeah <laughs> just to be clear and you know like is homer any you know not homer Simpson, but Homer. <laughs> is Homer any worse than name a book or TV show? You know, no. It's as re relevant when you are thinking about and, and trying to improve on human condition. Uh, that said, the, the technology is accelerating exponentially. So, you know, if you listen to some of these folks, you know, Last 15 years, we did about one century worth of uh, innovation, and next five years we'll do another, and then it'll take only one year to do another, and rapidly we'll reach a point of inflection that we're unclear about, you know, and that we, you know, buckle up, up your seatbelt because we're gonna all live through that, knock on wood, and our children or you know people you know who are younger, and I don't, I feel like I have some blind spots. And so I have a different kind of fear. And the fear is not like I'm afraid fear. 
but I have a fear about uh, not quite understanding what it is yet. And so the you know the three kind of things that I've started to trace was you know we understand uh, services and digital a little bit, and you know assume that's all kind of bytes, bits, zeros and ones. Then you have you know Adam, which is you know physical things. Uh, in the things that I've been involved in, I am very much focused on physical things that you interact with, but not with things that I can't see. But there is quite a bit of obviously, you know, uh, innovation going on, on on that end, nanotechnology or whatever. Even simple things like RFID. You know, my friend just squirted a little RFID into his cat so that his cat can go in at night to his own house and eat, and it will block his neighbor's cat from eating his food. Just very simple stuff. But wow, that didn't exist before. What is that? Uh, and then you got genetics. So you got these three big primitives again, accelerating at a fast pace. And I don't even know half, two thirds of those things. So that puts me, and then you see something like, uh, again, nothing on Facebook, but when you start seeing brain UI, I call it just brain UI, you know, and you're seeing, you know, virtual reality and you're seeing things that can mimic a human, you're just kind of scratching your head a little bit. <laughs> you know? So, so I don't have an answer, but I, I have a, I see a big, uh, big void of future that's kind of interesting and also a little bit uh, uh, fearful, and I think that's a good thing. I think so I was a little cautious. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, Jay, your point about blind spots and fear really resonates because I think as we look forward, obviously the future is always less defined and, you know, we've been talking a lot about, um, you know, macro level thinking and the impact of our work kind of broadening and deepening and as you start to think beyond the immediate tangible into the intangibles, it does get scary because you can't see what that is and you can't really understand it and so I think that's a real a real challenge for us um, as designers in the field. It's like, you know, we talk a lot about ambiguity is a big part of innovation and we need to be comfortable with ambiguity, but it's hard, especially when we're talking about all these big concepts and, you know, how do we solve for that stuff? So I think that's a real challenge that we have to deal with. And I okay. think it also, to, to your point, Rina, like artificial intelligence has definitely, like the potential is so vast to disrupt paradigms in a way that we have like no clue right now um, yeah. for the good and the better and the worse yeah. um, I guess if we're thinking about like big picture future I mean that's gonna be a major player in it and um, very exciting and also very, I mean it's such an exponential vast explosion of what it could mean that we like I think right now we have like it's so hard to grasp it and like we're we're working for and with IBM Watson too and it's like so in so early stages but like seeing the potential also when it especially when we think about what, what happens when that gets connected with other innovations in terms of material innovations or uh, all kinds of other thing with these things get combined. Um, let's see. Let's be curious. <laughs> I think that's a great word to, to, to sort of wrap things up on. And I think that uh, I, I really thank all of you. Um, it's, it's, certainly for me, it's been a fascinating uh, evening hearing all of your ideas. Uh, so thanks for sharing all of your insights. On behalf of RGD, I also thank everyone for attending tonight in all the satellite uh, locations. The next Future by Design takes place on Tuesday, September 26th, when we'll discuss the future of brand. Details and locations for this event will be posted at rgd.ca. And if a free screening is not available in your area, consider becoming a, a member of RGD to access the webcast from home and take advantage of other benefits exclusive to members of the association. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it.